Hurricane season on the Gulf runs from June 1st to November 30th, and with its coastal location, Texas City is no stranger to hurricanes. Throughout the early 1900s, cities along the Gulf Coast of Texas were devastated by hurricanes and their accompanying flood surges, causing Congress to authorize the United States Army Corps of Engineers to provide hurricane and flood protection. Currently, the Texas City Hurricane Protection System consists of three main components, which help to ensure the safety of our great city and its citizens. A 15.7 mile long levee located along the Texas City coast protects against hurricane flood surges, often the most devastating effect of a hurricane. Located 23 feet above sea level, the levee has withstood large storms such as Hurricane Ike in 2008. 1.3 miles of concrete wall also protect the levee in the event of a flood surge while a floodgate located on the north side of Moses Lake closes based on low tide to prevent flooding. A new system of drainage structures has also been built featuring two massive pumping stations which move water from lower areas within the levee into Moses Lake where excess water can be held. Operated by specialized city engineers, each screw pump can move an astonishing 125,000 gallons of water a minute. With a combined total of eight screws at both pumping stations, Texas City is capable of moving up to one million gallons of water per minute. In other words, the amount of water pumped out of our levee system could fill one and a half Olympic-sized swimming pools every 60 seconds. The Texas City Hurricane Protection System protects over 50,000 people and billions of dollars in industry. However, even with this extensive protection system in place, Texas City residents should still be prepared for hurricane season. As a public service, the City of Texas City holds an annual Hurricane Town meeting where experts speak on how to best prepare for the upcoming hurricane season. This year's meeting took place on June 10th. If you are unable to attend, full coverage of the 2014 meeting begins now. Right now I'm gonna ask Pastor Kevin Heron for the Fellowship of Texas City to come up and uh, lead us in a brief invocation, and then we'll begin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all of your blessings to us. Thank you for your hand upon our community. Thank you for the grace that you've shown us in the past, especially during Hurricane Ike. Thank you for the way that you spared us and allowed us to be a, a foundation, a platform, a, a headquarters of help to the rest of the community around us, for helping us to be good stewards of that help. Thank you for our city government, our county government. We pray, God, that you would be with us in this coming hurricane season. You are the God that stood in the face of the storm and said, peace, be still. We ask for that same grace during this year. We pray that you would bless our government, bless our mayor, Bless Derek Duckett, God, as he takes this new position, give him wisdom beyond his years. And I pray that you would bless this meeting tonight. Let your hand be upon our community. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We've got some special guests here in the audience with us, and I want to go ahead and take a minute to recognize them. Obviously, we have the Honorable Mayor Doyle, here, we appreciate him being here. We've got a couple city commissioners here. We've got Phil Roberts is here. Thelma Bowie is here. Deanne Haney, I think I saw her here. And we also have some, uh, some guests from the Highway Patrol. We've got Lieutenant James Ryer. We've got Lieutenant Joe Bridges. Sergeant Paul Atkins. 
And the district coordinator for the state of this area, Mike Jones. We also have the Texas City Fire Department Chief David Zaffrel and Assistant Chief Jesse Rubio and the Police Department Chief Robert Burby. I appreciate all of you being here. This meeting wouldn't take place without a lot of hard work behind the scenes, and I can't thank them all by name, but I want to take a minute to thank the Parks and Rec Department, the Public Housing Department, uh, George Fuller, and everybody else that had a hand in this meeting. Uh, they put in a lot of hard work, served the food, got it all ready, the flashlights, and got you all in and out of the door, set up the seating. So if we can take a minute and recognize them, I appreciate it. And I'll go ahead and turn the mic over to Matt Doyle. I also want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Uh, most importantly, you're going to get to watch Mr. Duckett, our new emergency management director, uh, do his first meeting. We're really happy to have Derek back in Texas City. Uh, you know, he grew up here, which was very important, and he also uh, was a fireman here. Left, the reason he knew all those DPS officers so well, he used to work with all of them. And then when Bruce uh, Clawson decided to retire, not easy to replace a guy like that. And we were very lucky to be able to get Derek uh, with all his experience and knowledge of the area to come home. And it's always good to have a hometown boy come on back. So we're really happy to have him as part of our team. And uh, Derek knows real quick, and that's what you all are gonna learn tonight, that we all need to be prepared. As an Eagle Scout, I learned that early on in my life. And, and during hurricane season, it's very important to be prepared. And one of our mottos here, and the Chiefs all know this, the Assistant Chiefs know it, the Captain and Derek knows it, we're gonna take all the help we can get, but we're gonna be prepared as if no help is coming. So uh, uh, that's, that's what you're gonna learn about tonight. You're gonna learn about how to be prepared. And please pay attention. And now again, I wanna thank all of you for being here. Uh, Tech City's a special place, and the reason it is is because of its citizens. Thank you. I've got a short video I'm going to show you. It's about five minutes, and the, there's dual purpose for the video. One is I wanted to kind of bring back, you know, six years has gone by since I, and people kind of get complacent and start to forget just how dangerous and uh, devastating a hurricane can be to a community. So I want to get that fresh on your mind because we just never know when something's going to happen. But the second purpose of the video is I want to remind this community how resilient and strong that you are when we work together. And like the mayor said, We'll take the help, but we as a community are one of the strongest on the Gulf Coast, and if not anywhere in this nation, and working together and helping our neighbors out and coming back after a storm like we did after Ike. So take this brief five minutes, we'll watch this video, and uh, we'll continue with the next speaker. On September 13th, 2008, Ike came ashore as a Category 2 hurricane causing extensive damage throughout Galveston County. We were directly in Ike's path. However, due to the city's history in dealing with violent storms, Texas City was surrounded by an extensive levee system which protected the town from the catastrophic flood damage suffered by other cities in our area. The levees also saved the city from a mandatory evacuation. Mayor Matthew Doyle and the Texas City Office of Emergency Management had closely tracked Hurricane Ike since it had formed in the Atlantic Ocean. Before Ike made landfall, they were prepared, coordinating police, fire, EMS, and public services into action even as the hurricane roared in from the Gulf. The return of operations to our petrochemical refineries, so valuable to Texas City's local economy and national security, were a top priority and quickly achieved. Local industry also responded in kind, donating fuel, food, and other supplies to those in need. Working with a myriad of emergency responders, along with the Texas City Independent School System and local heavy industry, 
The Texas City Emergency Command staff and mayor quickly began to allocate needed services throughout the city. Texas City Emergency Services were so successful, in fact, members of the command staff were dispatched to help other local city governments deal with this disaster. The Texas National Guard, Salvation Army, and other major relief agencies had been contacted before the storm struck and were on standby to assist after its passage, quickly coordinating relief efforts into our city. In fact, Texas City was so successful and efficient at handing out emergency supplies that we became a major hub for the distribution of relief supplies to other cities in Galveston County. Hundreds of thousands of emergency food rations, cases of water, along with tons of ice were distributed into Texas City and throughout Galveston County. Even as Texas City first responders began to assist with a few major emergencies around our town, the citizens of Texas City were rolling up their sleeves, beginning their own cleanup. Walk by walk, street by street, neighbors helped their fellow neighbors, cutting down trees, cleaning and stacking debris, all the while assisting in the cleanup. Those that had needed supplies shared with those that did not, while the young helped the old, quickly facilitating the city's recovery, again demonstrating the community spirit which makes Texas City such a great place to live, work, and play. While the restoration of telephone, power, and cable services continues throughout Galveston County, once again, Texas City was fortunate, having power and city services restored far in advance of other neighboring communities. We should be grateful to the thousands of workers who have come from across the United States to assist the state of Texas in its hour of need just as our communities have helped tens of thousands of others during past hurricane emergencies. Just like in 1947, when Texas City was devastated by explosions, 1961, when Hurricane Carl struck, or 1983, when Hurricane Alicia flooded the coast, Texas City and its citizens have risen like a phoenix time and time again, quickly restoring the community that is the end of the Texas Gulf Coast. That served as a good reminder, like I said, of just how dangerous a hurricane can be, but how important it is as a community to come together and help each other out. Let the public, public servants do their job, support them, and then help, like I said, help out your neighbor, and together we can all make this place uh, the great community that it is today. The next speaker that we have is the uh, Science and Operation Officer with the National Weather Service, Lance Wood. And what he's going to do, he's going to come here, and we appreciate him being here. He's going to come and talk to you about what happened last year, uh, what we kind of expect this year, and uh, just a couple other hurricane preparation tips for you. So, Lance. Well, uh, this one. Can you repeat? Well, thanks, Eric. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's nice to be uh, in Texas City this evening. Uh, that was a really well done video and I'm glad we're talking a little bit about Ike uh, since it's been a while and we need to remember that storm and some of the lessons learned as well. Um, tonight I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what happened last year. Forecasters always like to talk about the past a little bit. We're a little bit more accurate in, in that part of the forecast. Uh, but we'll also take a look at uh, what we expect for 2014. Um, and then a few of my favorite preparedness slides that I, I put in there. So I've got about 20 slides and, and we'll go through these. Um, this first slide is Tropical Storm Andrea making landfall um, along the Florida coast. Note that that was a early June storm from last year. That is the only tropical cyclone to make landfall last year. So for the west coast of Florida, it was a busy year early in the season. But for the rest of the U.S., it 
was a very inactive year. Um, so it kind of depends on whether or not you get the storm that year, whether or not you view it as an active year. So if you take a look at all the tracks in the tropical cyclones last year, you'll know real quick that there were actually were many out there, probably more than you thought. Um, this is a color-coded graphic by intensity, so everywhere you see green or, or yellow, you're looking at a tropical depression or a tropical storm, so not a real intense tropical cyclone. Where you see red, uh, that is where we had a hurricane. So real quickly, you see there's not a lot of red on there. Uh, so although we had 14 named storms, we only had a couple of hurricanes, and, and none of which made landfall in the United States. So if you, like I said, when you look at the season, you kind of have to think about a few different things as far as you know how active was it. If you just look at the number of storms, it was about normal. If you look at the number of hurricanes, it was below normal. If you look at landfalls, well, we only had that one as a, as a tropical storm uh, early in the season. Let's talk about a few facts from the season. Um, there were no major hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin last year. That's a pretty remarkable statistic. It's the first time since 1994 that has occurred. So although we had the storms out there, they had a hard time strengthening. It's also the fewest number of hurricanes we've seen out there since 1982. Only two hurricanes. So obviously, even though we had a, a few storms out there, they had a hard time getting going. And, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, there are only 45 hurricane hunter reconnaissance missions. Uh, there are only 435 hours. That's the fewest flight hours that we've seen since 1966. So they weren't even flying that much last year because we didn't have the big hurricanes threatening land, so we didn't have to do as much reconnaissance. So, you know, what's going on? We expected a really active year. Well, we actually had kind of a, a, a rare uh, pressure pattern in the middle to upper part of the atmosphere that we only seen once before, and it occurred in 94. And that, that pressure pattern produced a lot of sinking air that basically offset some other positives that we have. We have warmer than normal water. We had a lot of disturbances out there. But this sinking and dry air, we had a lot of dry air uh, coming in off the coast of Africa, actually basically countered the fact that we had some other positives. Another way to measure the season is how much energy was dissipated out there. So we have an index called the ACE index, and the way we come up with this is we square the wind speed every six hours for a tropical system and add it up. So the longer lived systems, the intense systems contribute a lot to this index. A weak storm that doesn't last very long doesn't contribute much. So if you look at this graphic from 1970 on the far left to 2013, you see a lot of year-to-year -year variability. You also see between 1970 and 94, not a lot of tall bars, not a lot of energy dissipated in most of those years. Since 95, we've had some big seasons. You might remember 2004, 2005, uh, really active years in the United States with landfalls and a number of hurricanes out there. Uh, but take a look at what's going on in 2013 here, this little red box. Not much energy dissipated because we didn't have any hurricanes out there. We didn't have the big storms. So if you look at that index, it actually comes up to be 33, which is less than the ACE index of Ike by itself. So Ike dissipated more energy than all the systems together last year when you had them up. So energy-wise, it was a very, very low season for us. So again, the why of that is because we had, like I said, a rare pressure pattern where we had dry sinking air over the main development region of the tropics, which is basically this area shown in orange. That's where a lot of systems tend to develop uh, as they're moving uh, from east to west across the tropics. We also had more wind shear than we thought we would have, and again, that's, that's due to that pattern. So we had an active year forecast, didn't really see that, uh, especially energy-wise, last year. So when we make a seasonal forecast, uh, we have to think about not only what you may be familiar with, which is weather, fronts, tropical waves, things that happen on the time frame of a week, maybe a little bit less. Well, when you do a seasonal forecast, you've got to move more into this climate range. Uh, so we look at things that happen on the order of years and uh, decades. But one thing we know that's going on in the background is we have a multi-decadal signal that's been positive since 95. So if you remember that graphic where I showed you all the energy, 
there are a lot of tall bars, a lot of real active years between 95 and now. Before that, there weren't many. So you can kind of think of, to understand this angle, it's kind of going on in the background. So if you're playing cards with somebody, there's more aces in the deck for, for an active year when this is in a positive phase. Now that doesn't mean we're necessarily going to get a big year because there's other things going on, like El Nino, uh, La Nina circulation. We'll talk a little bit about that. So, but really, you're kind of in that climate phase when you do a seasonal forecast. And again, there is some uncertainty uh, dealing with those kind of time frames and those kind of oscillations. So, when that signal's in a positive phase, we generally have warmer than normal water in the, in the Atlantic. We generally have a lot of disturbances. And we generally don't have a lot of wind shear in the upper part of our atmosphere, which tends to destroy storms. So that's kind of, like I said, it's going on in the background, but other things can disrupt it. If we look out there right now in that black box, this is where a lot of storms tend to develop. We call it the main development region. Uh, we don't really have a warmer than normal water or cooler than normal water. It's generally normal. So on this graph, your, your light blues are below normal, and your, your oranges and, and bright uh, yellows are above normal. When you look in that box, it's kind of, well, some, some greens in there. It's basically a very small departure from normal. If you look at the Gulf of Mexico, especially the Western Gulf, it's, it's also near normal, slightly below normal. Uh, we had a really cool spring. A lot of fronts came through kind of late in the year, and that tends to keep, uh, tends to keep at least for now, the Gulf uh, not above normal. So I alluded to this just a, a few slides ago. When we're talking about El Nino La Nina, it is important for the hurricane forecast. What it's referring to is the water temperatures in the tropical Pacific. When we have an El Nino, which is warmer than normal water, shown by the, the bright reds, uh, that's an El Nino. It tends to produce more wind shear across the Atlantic. So what goes on in the Pacific does affect the Atlantic because the ocean and the atmosphere are coupled. When we have a La Nina, or a neutral condition, which is the La Nina is cooler than normal water, and we tend to have more hurricanes and less wind shear in the tropics, at least in the tropical Atlantic. So what's going on out there right now? Well, we're actually transitioning from a neutral phase, which is not much departure, to El Nino. And El Nino is shown by this, this pink area of, of the graph up here. It's warmer than normal water. We run a lot of our models uh, for the hurricane season, and most of them are showing at least a, a weak El Nino, some of them showing a moderate to strong El Nino by the fall. Well, it's going to be kind of critical whether or not we're weak El Nino or strong El Nino, because a strong El Nino really does produce a lot of wind shear, and we'll keep the numbers really low this year. So we're going to keep monitoring that. I think it's a good bet we have an El Nino, but how strong it is, still somewhat uh, questionable. Uh, so we know uh, for our seasonal expectations, we know that the multi-decadal oscillation is, is still positive, although it's a weak positive. We're not seeing a whole lot of warm water out there. We've seen stronger indications that this oscillation was, was even stronger than it is right now. Uh, we know El Nino is coming, and we know that's a negative for storm development in the Atlantic, but we're not sure how big of a negative it is. Because of that, we're expecting either a below normal season, if it ends up being a moderate to strong El Nino, or a near normal season if it's a weaker El Nino. And what would you get in a normal season? 12 named storms, six hurricanes, uh, a 71 to 111 on that east index I showed you earlier. So note that a normal season has a much higher energy index than what we saw last year, uh, more than double what we saw last year. NOAA, my parent agency, uh, I'm, I'm with the National Weather Service, so NOAA is, is a, a step up in the government. They actually produced the seasonal forecast. And if you just want to look at the raw numbers that they came up with, they forecast a range of 8 to 13 storms. So 8 would be below normal, 13 would be closer to normal, 3 to 6 hurricanes, 1 to 2 major hurricanes. And then they give some probabilities uh, for below and near normal, which are about the same uh, for this coming year. And like I said, if the El Nino gets stronger as we go through the summer, the below normal probabilities are going to go way up. Well, here's a graphic that's pretty important for those wanting to know what might happen with some your landfall throughout this year, which is, is really important. Um, if you look at the percent of seasons where there's one hurricane making landfall along the Gulf Coast, so we're looking at this graphic here. On this side, it would be, whoops, I'll go back up. Right in there. So we're looking at this part of the graphic. So we have color-coded by whether or not it's a La Nina or El Nino, and the probability of getting 
a hurricane, one hurricane making landfall. So you notice that El Nino, that red bar, is showing greater than the 60% chance of a landfall even in an El Nino year in the Gulf of Mexico. Where the El Nino really shows up as far as decreasing activity is the multiple landfalls, which you see on the bottom graphic. Uh, so note that the chance of getting multiple hurricanes making landfall on the Gulf Coast is way down here. So more like the 10%. So the El Nino doesn't necessarily mean we're not gonna get a hurricane. It just means the chance of having a lot of hurricanes out there making landfall goes way, way down. So that's an important, I think, distinction to make when you're talking about preparedness for the season. Something else I want to talk a little bit about, and I think you've probably heard this before, is that we've removed storm surge out of the Sapper Simpson hurricane wind scale because of storms like Katrina, Sandy, I, uh, the big storms that may not be really intense, but they're producing a large storm surge. So we only want to use this scale, category one to five, with one being a, a weaker hurricane and five being a strong hurricane. We want to use this for your wind damage potential. And it is significant when a storm goes from one category to the next for wind damage. And you might wonder, well, why is that? Well, that's because the force of the wind, the power of the wind, the damage producing power of the wind is, is, is related by the square of the wind speed. So this isn't a line that just gradually goes up. It goes up by an order of magnitude as you go from one category to the next. So if you're expecting $1 million of wind damage with a category one, you're more like 10 million with a two, 100 million with a three, uh, 1 billion with a four. Also note our last category three to make landfall in this region, which we, we deem a major hurricane, was Alicia back in 1983. So it's been a while. I was 14 when that happened living in Sharpstown, the south, southwest side of Houston, I remember blowing down all my fences and it kind of got me involved in meteorology later on. Well, I'm 45 now, <laughs> so it's been a long time. I still remember it, but uh, remember Ike was a two, a big storm uh, surge producer, but not, not nearly the wind producer we could get. So, you know, a lot of times people focus with the hurricane as a line on the map. Remember that hurricanes are different sizes. They have different each one's unique. So here's a picture of the wind fields color-coded by intensity. So on the left, you see Hurricane Umberto making landfall in 2007 near High Island. And one year and 30 minutes later, Ike makes landfall on September 13, 2008. Look at the size difference. Everywhere you see yellow and orange, you're seeing hurricane force winds. Okay, wherever you see green, you're seeing tropical storm force winds. Well, you can put about 10 or 12 Humbertos inside of Ike. And the maximum intensity difference, it's only a category. You know, Humberto is a category one, Ike category two, so if you're just looking at that, you're kind of missing the point here. You know, Humberto produced a maximum sur sur surge of about five feet. That's a little storm. Ike's got that big circulation just pushing water on shore and producing storm surge over Bolivar about 16, 17 feet. So a lot different there. But the max intensity, not so much different. The other thing Alberto taught us is things can happen quick here. Uh, the Gulf gets warm, very warm by August, September. Things can happen right off our coast. This loop is less than 24 hours, and we're watching Alberto develop. It's early morning. I just come into work ship. We don't have a tropical system yet. Now we have a tropical storm. We're moving towards noon. It's starting to get more banding. We're moving through the afternoon. It's intensifying, uh-oh, we might have a hurricane here. Now it's eight o'clock, we're getting a hurricane developing off our coast, and it's gonna make landfall just after midnight there. Really tiny storm, but anybody that, that was in High Island for this storm basically experienced uh, a, basically like a, a tornado type wind damage, an EF1 tornado. It produced about 85 miles an hour wind damage, a lot of roofs, a lot of some trees and power lines. Didn't affect the, uh, areas to the west so much of High Island, but for those people, it was a significant weather event. So you could literally wake up that morning, not be paying attention to the weather, really not know anything's going on, and you have a hurricane make landfall that evening. Now again, this is it's kind of an extreme example, but it does happen. So what about the major hurricanes that have made landfall here? Where did they come from? Well, if you look at that red box up there, so that's the area we care about. That's the upper Texas coast, southeast Texas. We've had nine category three or four hurricanes cross that area since 1851. Take a look at some of them. We had Rita, 
coming from the Bahamas. We had the 1900 storm going over Cuba. I think the 1915 storm is in there. Then we've got some other ones. Audrey, Alicia in the Gulf of Mexico. So we've got a mix here, some long track hurricanes and some Gulf developers. Well, four of those formed in the Gulf. And this is how much time you would have with those four from getting notification that you have a storm out there to having adverse conditions. So with a 32 hurricane, a little less than two days, 45, a little more than three days. Audrey, uh, really devastated southwest Louisiana, a little under two days, and then Alicia, you know, was our storm, uh, a little more than two days. Well, is that enough time to act? Well, we know about these things, we plan for them, but it's probably only enough time to act if you've already got your plan and you kind of thought through a case like this. Um, so I always recommend people to live here along the coast. You know, even if you do plan on evacuating, uh, you still want to have supplies on hand to, to handle the power outage and get should have to shelter in place. So just a couple more slides here. Just want to talk over some new things that are coming this year. Uh, the National Hurricane Center located in Miami actually puts out the track forecast for the, the tropical cyclones. They're actually gonna have a new inundation graphic. We didn't actually have this during Ike, but it's gonna be color-coded. It's available on their website, um, www.nhc.noaa.gov. You can just search National Hurricane Center in a Google uh, search and you'll find it. So what this does is it's doing the work for you. We're running a lot of models, a lot of ensembles of models, uh, and then we, we basically take a case, a worst case type scenario, and color code it for preparedness. So from low to high, low wind blue, that's a low inundation. Inundation being water over the land, so you don't even have to know your elevation. We're doing that work for you. You see an example of what it might have looked for as Ike was approaching down there on the bottom uh, right of the screen. So uh, we can use this now as soon as a hurricane watch is issued. For about 48 hours, maybe a little earlier than that, if we can twist their arm if we have a big storm coming and we'd like to get this out a little earlier. Because uh, I know some of our evacuation plans obviously are a little beyond 48 hours. Uh, but I think this will help. It's easy, it's color coded. You don't have to understand all of the uh, ensemble models to get a picture that you, that you can use. The other thing that's new is uh, we've changed up the, the, the tropical weather outlook graphic. You know, we've always had disturbances highlighted there for 48 hours uh, and their chance of development color-coded. There's gonna be a new five-day one. Um, the probabilities for a five-day outlook are already there, but there's not a special graphic for it as you see on the bottom right. Uh, now there's a graphic, actually not there yet, but it's gonna be there late July, early August as we get towards the peak of the season. You'll be able to see ellipses and circles of areas that may develop over the next five days. So if you really like to watch these threats as they develop, this would be a really good website to monitor. The last slide I have, just a couple reminders. Uh, on June 1st of this year, it had, it had been 3,142 days since the last Category 3 or greater storm to make landfall in the U.S. That's a very long stretch and it shatters our records uh, since 1900. Uh, the last one being Wilma from 2005, uh, in October of that year, making landfall in South Florida. So it's been a long time since the U.S. has had a major hurricane, a big wind producer, making landfall. So we need to remember that. It's going to surprise some people, I think, when it happens. Also note, this is the, the tracks of all of our tropical cyclones from 1983. You see Alicia making landfall there in Southeast Texas. Take a look at this. There were, this was an El Nino year probably a stronger El Nino than we're gonna see this year. But no storms that year were really able to develop in the main development region. There was too much wind shear. So these storms that did develop, they, they developed close to the coast, and they weren't around that long. And they were able to develop in this area with a little bit less wind shear and you got north of the tropics. So even in a very inactive year, only four storms, one of them could find you. And I think that's, that's all I've got for this evening. Thanks for your attention. Hopefully you'll be ready this year. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Our next speaker, I don't know that they've ever been here before to talk, but it's probably one the one person whenever a hurricane comes or after a hurricane comes that you really want to hear from that uh, you feel like don't get there quite quick enough, but we know they're out there working is uh, Texas, New Mexico. We've got two representatives from Texas, New Mexico that are here. We've got Wayne Blaylock and Greg Myers, and they were uh,
gracious enough to come, and, and Wayne's going to come up here for a few minutes and talk about what they do in preparation for and uh, recovery from a hurricane. Good evening. Every spring, Texas, New Mexico Power, uh, we start preparing for the upcoming storm season. And uh, a few things that we do to get prepared, we revisit our emergency operation plan and we make sure that it's updated. Uh, we also raise our uh, material levels at our warehouses in preparation for storm season, poles and stuff like that. Uh, fuel, emergency fuel, we've got to have fuel to get these big trucks around in the critical time frames that we got there in the beginning. Uh, we have several meetings and we conduct a mock drill by June 1st. And our emergency operation plan is reviewed with our employees and, and we discuss it. You know, we monitor the weather on a daily basis. Every day we're looking at some weather sites and keeping an eye on the weather. And we really go into the storm mode about 120 hours out. Uh, at about 48 hours prior to an event, most likely uh, the majority of the TMP employees will be released. Uh, myself and a core group will uh, be working out of our Alvin facility and we will be working uh, and responding to emergency calls until it's not safe to do so anymore. And that's normally around when the winds get up in excess of 40 miles an hour. Uh, I'm in contact with city officials through the event and uh, communicating the condition of our transmission distribution system. And then uh, once the storm passes and the winds get uh, back down below 40 miles an hour, myself and the core group will leave the Ivan facility and that's when we uh, do a damage assessment and start uh, restoring the power. Our TMP employees, uh, just so you know, they're expected to be back within 24 hours and that's when we start restoring service to our high priority circuits and we start uh, performing damage assessments of the TMP system. We, uh, uh, at that time, our crews that we have in uh, North and Central Texas, uh, they relocate down here to the coast. And in addition to that, we got crews from New, Me New Mexico that relocate into this region. And the mutual assistance uh, groups allocate crews to Texas, New Mexico power. Uh, the crews that come in here uh, to help restore power here in Texas City will most likely be staging at the Gulf Greyhound uh, Park. And uh, once they get here, they go through a safety orientation and, and we get them to work and they'll be assigned to the different substations here in Texas City. Uh, and the way that we work on restoring power is we have all of our circuits prioritized. We work with the highest priority circuits first and then work our way down uh, based on the way that we have them prioritized. And the process every day is communicated to the city where they can communicate to the citizens where we're at working. That's basically all I have. Appreciate it, Wayne. I'd like to give another round of applause to Lance and Wayne and thank them for their time to come out here and talk to us. We're almost done, but we're going to get into the meat and potatoes real quick in preparation. And this is really the most important part and, and why, you, why you're here. And uh, before I get into that real quick, I realized I left out a group I needed to thank. Uh, the Citizens Police Academy of Texas City is a great organization. All these ladies and gentlemen in the back that kind of welcomed you in and got you through the line. They volunteer all their time. They do a lot of things in the community. Uh, I'd like to thank them, especially for, for doing what they did today. And if you have any interest in joining and getting involved in the community with them, I'm sure they would be glad to talk to you when this is over. So I just didn't want to forget them before we go on. First thing I want to talk to you before we get into preparation is I want to talk about the things that make Texas City special and really, in my opinion, one of the uh, safest places on the Gulf Coast to live, probably anywhere on the coast in the nation for that matter. Tech City is unique in that we have three different uh, protection systems that a lot of places aren't fortunate enough to have. First and foremost, which everyone lives here probably knows about, we've got the levee system. We've got about 15.7 miles of an earth levee, and then we've got another uh, uh, couple miles of concrete wall 
that uh, keep our city safe from this, the storm surge. And like, like Lance was saying, with Ike, it was like only a Category 2 storm, but the storm surge is something probably similar to a Category 4. So that levee really saved us. For those of you who are here and remember, if not for that, we've been in the same position that Galveston was in, and uh, Tech City was really spared. The other thing we have going for us is we have the floodgate. Well, for those of you who don't understand how that works uh, or aren't super familiar with it, when we get a low tide in Moses Lake and we know that a storm's in the Gulf are heading our way, we'll shut that floodgate. And so that the water, the water depth in, in Moses Lake is so low when we start using the third uh, part of our uh, flood protection system, the, the pump stations, and we start pumping water back into Moses Lake, our city doesn't fill up with water. So that's, that's the reason for it. And our two pump stations are uh, amazing. If you've never had the opportunity to go out there. Each pump is capable of uh, pumping out 125,000 gallons per minute. So when every one of them is up and running, our two pump stations can pump out a million gallons per minute, which uh, you can really equate to that. That's, that's a whole lot of water moving. So we're thankful to have that. And that's why Tech City really is one of the safer places to be, even though we're on the Gulf Coast. Now into preparation, you probably heard it a couple times, and you're going to hear it multiple times over this season, is to make a family plan. Uh, plans don't have to be complicated, they don't have to cost a lot of money, uh, they should cover multiple problems, and everybody in the family needs to know the plan. Who's going to get groceries? What groceries do we need? What dietary concerns do we have? What does Fido eat? Medications. Do I have a list of all my medications? Do I have my phone numbers written down in case my cell phone's not working? All of these things, not real complicated, but if you wait till the last minute, you're going you're gonna to forget something, and then when you actually need it, you're not going to have it. So start thinking about that now. Communicate that with your, your husband, your wife, your kids, uh, and start talking about what you're going to do in the event that we do have a storm. Uh, like I said, the, the med medications you're going to need, it's three or four days, really and truly, if you can get more than that and have it on hand, that's going to be ideal. Uh, the clothes, important papers, your uh, passports, driver's license, uh, all those kind of important papers, pictures, anything that's sentimental to you that you can get and take with you, uh, grab those things. Like I said, the dietary needs. And one of the important parts of all this stuff, you don't want to have it scattered around your house where you're running around last minute trying to, where did I put that? If you, if you have the opportunity, get like a trash can, uh, a box, something, put it in the garage market hurricane ready something like that and have all that stuff in there so whenever a storm does present itself you can go out there you grab it one place and you and your family can get out safely decide where you're going to go and how you're going to get there like i said you don't need to go far you just need to get off the coast we're not avoiding the wind you almost can't avoid the wind uh, hurricanes they'll travel all the way up the nation into ohio like ike did i think it ended up dying off somewhere up there in the in the uh, north middle east uh, you're avoiding the storm surge. So get off the coast. Inland about 50 miles is adequate. Uh, I know a lot of people's plans are just to get to Alvin or Santa Fe, something like that, but you just want to get off the immediate coast uh, and keep, keep aware of the storm's path. Make a communication plan with your family. This is important. For those of you that are here during uh, Ike, you realize right after the storm, Landlines may not have worked for a while. Cell phones certainly didn't work for a while. I mean, just everybody was trying to use them and the system was overloaded. And so it was hard to talk to your loved ones. That's why it's important to have a plan, not just with your immediate family here, but with families that maybe not be on the coast and are watching and trying to make sure that you're okay. Let them know how you plan to communicate with them. Let them know where you plan to go so they're not worried sick about you if they can't get in communication with you. I know when I drove with my wife from California to Georgia, we bought little two-way radios just in case we passed through a dead spot where cell phones weren't great and we could, because we were in two separate cars and that way we could just talk like that. And that obviously isn't going to work if you separate by 50 miles, but if you're new in the family or in town, that's just a, another something that you could have on hand to, to make sure that you can talk. Uh, shelter in place might be ordered or evacu evacuation might be necessary. If you're in uh, our call-out system, which we'll get to here in just a minute, we're going to give you all of that information, what, what we recommend. We're going to be watching the news or the weather daily, hourly, uh, especially when something starts forming in the Gulf. And we're going to communicate with you. And so keep in contact with us, and we're going to let you know what we would like for you to do and try to follow best you can with, with the advice that we give you. For those of you that were here during Rita, you probably don't even like to hear the name. Uh, if you were one of the lucky few that got stuck out on the freeway for 48 hours at a time and traveled five miles. Uh, 
we've got some better things in place. Uh, all the roads will be open. They have an evacuation plan where it's gonna be staggered. If you live immediately on the coast, Port Bolivar, Galveston, ideally, and I'll use the word ideally because people are gonna do what people are gonna do, but if everyone follows the plan, we're, they're gonna get the order to evacuate first. Uh, communities like Texas City are gonna follow right after and I'll up on into Houston, so that way we don't have the log jam. But the difference between Rita and now, like I said, they've realized they had a good plan in place, they just didn't have it perfect. So they had a lot of roads shut off, side roads and things like that. We encourage you to take those FM roads, to take the different paths rather than the main evacuation routes that everyone knows of, to find another way to get past the crowd that's gonna be going with you. There'll be assistance out on the major, major roadways. Uh, Highway Patrol's here and you can talk to them when this meeting's over. They'll explain to you they're gonna be out in force. They've got troopers to come in from all over the state uh, and come down here to assist. So, we're gonna have we're gonna have traffic moving. We're gonna get you out of the, the immediate harm's path. But follow, like I said, follow the orders you hear from the city. Follow the evacuation uh, timelines that we give them, and hopefully uh, everything will be much smoother than Rita. This is just a map that shows the evacuation uh, zones of who's gonna go first. It's kind of hard to see in this map, but the yellow area is the immediate coast, and Texas City's kind of got a shaded area next to it, and it's next, and so forth, and so on. Like I said. Again, just to reiterate, all the roads are going to be open. Use the FM roads. Uh, all the cities should be open. Uh, and remember, you don't have to leave the state, but you've got to get off the coast. You don't got to drive to Ohio. You don't have to drive to your sister's house in New York. Just get off the coast. Here we've got an image of all your uh, the major evacuation routes for hurricanes that are listed as evacuation routes. But everyone knows if you're getting around Houston traffic, there's numerous ways to get in and out of traffic. So plan those out. That's part of your family plan. Know what, you know, if you plan on going up straight up 45 and you hear that it's log jam, know another way out. So that's just part of the plan. If you can't evacuate by yourself, we're going to assist you. Here you see about 200 buses staged in the high school parking lot. The state, we, when we start getting a uh, storm coming and forming in the Gulf, and we think it's coming this way, the state's going to bring down about 200 buses that are going to stage here in Texas City. And so we'll have you meet us up in here at the Dual Center, and we'll load you up on the buses. And these are just a couple pictures for Mike. Now one caveat I'll say on this, we are glad to assist you, and the state is, is awesome in helping out in this, but if you have the means to do it yourself, by all means, you're probably gonna be more comfortable. I mean, the buses, they're nice for what they are. They're gonna get you out of harm's way. They're gonna provide you with shelter and food and, and take care of you, but it's not gonna be the Ritz-Carlton. You know, you're not gonna get room service and all that kind of stuff. You'll probably get a cot, three meals a day, and that's gonna be about it. So it's, it's great for those folks that don't have the means or got family that need help getting out, and we encourage you to use it and let us know. That, that you have those members in your family that need the assistance. But like I said, if you have, if you have your own means of transportation, you're probably gonna be happier and more comfortable being able to move around like that on your own. But let you know this is here for you. If you travel with us to a shelter in Austin area, you're gonna be brought back as soon as the city is deemed safe to live in. And Mayor Doyle is the one that makes that call. Uh, you can bring your pets with you, you, put them in a cage, they can sit in the seat next to you or sit in your lap. Now, if you've got a big Great Dane, I, I don't know what to tell you on that. So part of the family plan, right? Figure out what you're going to do with that monster. Like I said, you're going to get shelter, food, and reasonable care in Austin. Bring the medicine that you need for a couple days, clothing for a couple days, basic needs like your hygiene products, all that kind of stuff. You know what you need. You know what, what med medications you need, dietary problems you have. Uh, make that list. Have it on hand and go ahead and prepare to take that with you when you go. And as I said, you'll be brought back when safe. And the mayor's gonna make that call. Now, if you're watching the news, you're probably not gonna hear a whole, whole lot about Texas City. They should be talking about Texas City, but they're probably not. They're gonna talk about Houston and the other uh, places that have a little, a little bigger population than we do. So it's important as a citizen of Texas City that you wait till we let you know it's safe. Just if Houston tells you it's safe, doesn't mean Texas City's safe to come back. And that's number one priority is to be on our call out system so that we can let you know what's going on in the city. And that way you're getting accurate information right from us and not from a third party source that may not be correct. 
What you see here, that's the Tech City website. If you have access to a computer and you haven't signed up or you know you have family members in the area uh, that maybe don't have access to the internet and aren't signed up on our call down system, go on that website and you'll see on the right side, you'll either see this or you'll see it says emergency, uh, emergency notification sign up. Click on that button and it'll ask you to enter your, your name, your address, your phone number, email, whatever you want to provide. We can, we can get you information on your cell phone, on your house phone, text message, email, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. We send out information on it. So we don't want it. We're not sending it to third parties to get you spam mail. We want it so that way we can let you know if there's any kind of danger in the community, when a hurricane's coming, what we plan on doing, what we plan on doing during the hurricane, and what we're doing after. So it's vital that you get signed up. We had the, the Citizens Police Academy back there. Should have asked you when you came in. If you're not already signed up, if you don't get the calls, if you didn't get the call about this meeting today, you're not signed up. Or something happened, your number's gone, so sign up again. So get your number on there, every cell phone you have, and if you've got family member in the area that aren't signed up, sign them up. Uh, and if this doesn't work for you, call me anytime and I'll sign you up myself. But it's, it's very important that everybody in the community is getting the, the information and is on that system because we're going to let you know as soon as we know anything what's going on in the community so that way you're not left to wonder. That's all I have. Uh, I want to thank you again for taking the time. I know uh, a little bit long, almost an hour, but this is vitally important that y'all came here. Uh, we'll be around after if you have any questions. I know some of the officials I named earlier will be around to answer your questions. And we have, I think, a good bit of food left over. Uh, crowds were light this year, so if you want to grab some extra food, first come, first serve, head out the door and grab some extra hot dogs and all that kind of stuff. So thank you very much for coming.